Welcome to Clear Eyes, Full of Hearts, a podcast presentation of Cadence 13 in association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. This is an episode-by-episode episode look at the award-winning TV show Friday Night Lights, created by Peter Berg. I am Stacey Orstano. I played Mindy Collette Riggins. And I'm Derek Phillips, and I played Billy Riggins. Our assumption is that you, our gentle audience, have already watched the show. But if you haven't already, go watch Friday Night Lights, which is currently streaming on Netflix and Peacock TV, because there will be spoilers in our podcast. Hey, you guys. Also, we have some awesome, awesome merchandise. That's right, baby. So go check out our brand new website designed by Eleanor Carez, who is at Eleanor Carez on Instagram. Our website is cleareyesfullheartspod.com. That's right, cleareyesfullheartspod.com. You can pick up sweatshirts and cups and mugs and hats and T-shirts and get that special little gift for your, your grandmother for Christmas coming up here. A little landing strip T-shirt because nothing says I love you, Grandma, <laughs> like a landing strip T-shirt. And every few weeks, we will do an audience participation episode just to answer your questions. So email us everything you've ever wanted to know at cleareyesfullheartspod at gmail.com today. We are talking about season one, episode 12, What to Do While You're Waiting. It was written by Carrie Aaron and directed by David Boyd. Here we go with our NBC synopsis. During a bye week, the Panthers wait for the future of the season to be determined by a game between two opponents. The Street family continues their lawsuit against Coach Taylor and Tyra deals with her mother's abusive relationship with her boyfriend. I'm sure you noticed this when you were reading it, Stacey, they're reading the NBC synopsis, but David Boyd directed this episode. And for those of you who don't know, David Boyd was our DP on Friday Night Lights. He's the guy who came up for, with the look mm-hmm. of Friday Night Lights. He shot the pilot. So it's really cool that David Boyd got an opportunity to direct an episode on Friday Night Lights. And one of the things that you'll notice going forward is there's a lot of people on Friday Night Lights that started out in one position and then moved up in the ranks as the show went on. And then our camera operator, a guy named Todd McMullen, is going to wind up DPing Friday Night Lights. And at one point, Todd McMullen is -hmm. actually going to wind up directing episodes of Friday Night Lights. So as just as this show was a springboard for actors to move on and do other things, it was also a springboard for every facet of of every person in the business. Just thinking about the the episode overall, I remember thinking, my God, God, that shot is beautiful. There's some, we'll talk about it when we get into it, at the rodeo with the Ferris wheel lights and everything behind them, and they were just beautiful. Yeah, David Boyd nailed it on this one. I was talking to Nam Bernstein, who was our line producer on this show. And the line producer is the person who just kind of makes sure that the show stays under budget and everything else. But this was years ago. We had an 80% retention rate on this show which means that 80% of our crew stuck around year to year. So 80% of the people that were there from the beginning were there at the very end. And that is very, very rare. And they also just ended up being so quick, setting everything up, camera shots and lights. And it was like, oh, boop, done, moving on. It's an intense episode on and off the field. So let's get into the highlights. First, to, I, I want to say eight to 10 minutes is, is a bunch of football talk that I did not understand. There is definitely a little bit of football talk. One of the things I wanted to talk about, especially since we just mentioned that we had David Boyd directing this episode, if you look in the very beginning, you got these beautiful Texas skylines and beautiful countryside. I wanted to give a shout out to David Calgill, who plays Sam and Sammy Mead, because he starts this episode off. I, I love this guy. It's just tonally we get, you know, the minute he comes on and starts doing his Slam and Sammy Mead thing, it just sets a tone for the whole entire episode. On any show that I've ever worked on in my life, when you get into a car, there's somebody that comes over there and starts squeegeeing the window and making it pristine and crystal clear so you can see right through it. And on Friday Night Lights, we never cleaned a windshield once. And it's not because they were lazy or anything. It's because it sets a tone. There's bugs on the windshield. It's dirty. It's gritty. It's, it gives you the more of a, a Texas vibe. That's true. There's a lot of dirt in Texas. But how beautiful are those opening shots? A lot of times that'll be a second unit thing, but that you got to think with David Boyd directing this episode, like he put a little bit more emphasis on those, those expo- that exposition stuff of just setting up those scenes. We'll talk about it more when we get to the rodeo. But on to the football part for Stacy. The Panthers did all of this work. They won all of these games, but there's still a chance they might not go to the playoffs. I don't understand. So if Buckley beats Arnett Meade, then Dylan will still be alive and will make the playoffs. But if Arnett Meade beats Buckley, then Dylan is no longer in the playoffs. So everyone is hoping against hope that this team Buckley winds up beating Arnett Meade. 
And it's kind of a shot in the dark because Arnett Mead is just a way better team. Buckley's got no chance of beating them, we think. Who is Arnett Mead again? Arnett Mead is our crosstown rivals. If you remember the episode where Saracen goes over and beats the crap out of the guy's car with uh, Riggins and everybody else. Uh, yes. And then later on, they come back to beat up Saracen. That's who Arnett Mead is. So we need Buckley, this team that's not very good, to beat Arnett Mead, who is very good, in order for the Panthers to make the playoffs. Okay. So chance is not looking good. I understand no. more now. I have never identified so quickly to a character as Waverly when she was listening to Smash talk about this and she walked out of the restaurant. And I was like, I am with you, Waverly. I understand. My dad has a plaque that he used to hang up in the house. It said, we interrupt this marriage to bring you football season. My dad watches a, a, a ton of football. And I always remember, like, if I had somewhere to go and I needed him to drive me somewhere, I'd be like, okay, dad, how long? And he'd be like, four minutes. And I was like, four real minutes or four football minutes? Because that yeah. means 45 minutes. So let's just be exactly. honest. So Matt's dad is still around. The, the whole house has such a, a weird, different atmosphere in it now with the dad being there. And then there was this like gentleman's handshake between the two of them, Matt and his dad, because he's going to stay and not go back yeah. to Iraq. You know what I loved about this scene is Grandma Saracen moving around in the background. She's in, having one of her spells kind of, but she, she also knows more about football than probably anyone on this show besides coach. Yeah. And even Matt's dad go, is she making any sense? And I'm like, I think she's making more sense than she ever has before, actually. Right yeah, now. she's making sense. Make her the offensive coordinator. Come on. <gasps> then she could be on the sidelines too. I would jam so <laughs> hard if Grams became just like a like a, a sideline coach. Yeah, move over, Blue Deckard. Okay. So then, holy, holy. Coach and Tammy just having a regular morning and a process over comes up and gives them, a, I mean, I guess a lawsuit, whatever it is. They're getting, I, I, they're getting they've sued. They've been subpoenaed, right? Is, is that, that what it is? It is? A subpoena, yes. So yeah. process server brings you a subpoena. Yeah. And then he says it's from the Street family. But then, of course, even the process server has some football questions for Coach. Because, you know, yeah. the town is crazy. Yeah, it's the devil town. So we just see this process server hand over the papers to Coach and Tammy. And he says it's from the Street family. So I think we as the audience know, know what's going on because we've seen this before. But then Jason is going into this store and he is like, it's so sweet, super excited to talk to this guy that I'm assuming he comes in and talks to before every game. And the guy just looks at him and walks away and says he can't talk about it. And it feels very stifled and very weird. And then there's a shot of the newspaper and the newspaper knows that coach has been sued before even Jason knows. I think his world just got crushed in that second. It's Folks didn't tell him this. After all the things that Street's been through in the course of this first season of the show, now he's caught in the crosshairs of a legal dispute that's going to pin him against the Dylan Panthers. The town's going to hate him. Yeah. While they're vying for a playoff spot, it's like really good timing. Joanne Street and Mitchell Street. Piling onto this kid. We need some good stuff to start happening for Street. Had enough. I want, I want the kid to have a tiny bit of a break. And then I screamed at the TV, hey, that's my mama. I did not realize that Dana Wheeler Nicholson, who plays Miss Colette in this show, I didn't realize she came in so early. And then I got very upset and I screamed, who is that man in my house? That's Bob. Oh, sure. It's, just, it's Bob. He's just one of the lovely gentlemen that the Colette <laughs> women will wind up dating during the course of this show. Yeah, that's Bob. We can pick him. He's top five worst. Colette daters. Are you are you in the top five? <laughs> of worst? No. Nah. Yeah. Billy's okay, great. I would what did Billy no. ever do? Just steal some stuff? Talking about her daughter's butt, it's so uncomfortable. Ugh. And I think like Tyra's been living Awful. in that situation for a while with this dude. The, the writers are just kind of setting up that this isn't something new. This is probably the 10th guy that's been around that's been an idiot. Angela makes some bad choices. She does. So do her children sometimes. Her whole family. So that Jason goes home. And we do find, like, asks his parents, cannot wrap my head around the parents not telling Jason that they were going through with it and doing it because it is fully about him. Yeah. But I also understand what they're doing. I mean, I get that they, they have no recourse at this point in time. They financially can't afford it. So, I, I mean, I'm assuming they're suing the, when they say they're suing the school, they're suing the school's insurance company, probably. I don't know. But like, it's, yeah, coach. Coach says yeah. something later about like we're covered. The school is covered and the team is covered, but he personally, yeah, I don't think Coach he's covered. personally isn't covered. What are they going to get out of Coach? 
I know. You know they, they got two people on a teacher's salary. It's a tough situation overall. I understand why they're doing it. That's the that's thing. That's one of the things that's really good about this show is like you understand why it's happening. And, but like, ugh. Yeah, they're not the bad guys here. No, like no. Nobody really is the bad guy here. But knowing what we know about what happens in a family like that with having to get a, a wheelchair accessible van and making your house wheelchair accessible and all of the medical things that they're going to have to go through. Jason, like even Mr. Street, like he's says they've completely blown through their savings because of this. This isn't something you prepare for in a million years. No. God, it's got to be so hard. I would just like to say this because it makes me very happy. The annual Women's Booster League Rodeo Fundraiser and Fair. Oh, yeah. The uh, AWBLRFNF. The FNF. I like it. Coach didn't have trouble with this one, though. I had to write that out because I'm like, what what, what would they call that for shorthand? The Re- Obler- annual, f- annual Women's Booster League Radio Fundraiser and Fair. I was just really excited about that rolled off of Kyle's tongue like effortlessly. Yeah. And I was like, oh, he practiced that. He had to practice that. Because <laughs> he couldn't get the cheerleading one right to save his soul. But this one, no. it, this one's important because it gives them money. I get it. If it's yeah. booster, then it's for football money, right? But if you've been in Texas long enough, you know that there are things like this that exist. Moving on, would just yes. like to point out Buddy Garrity at work doing yeah. job things. This is new. You know, I'm not going to let this Buddy Garrity hate persist any longer. Buddy Garrity is the glue that holds Dylan together. What? So what if he takes an occasional... He takes an occasional half day every day. So what? What do you want? You want a good football team or do you want a, a good deal on a 2006 Ford F-150? I mean, I want a, I want a good deal on a, on a Ford F- F-150. Listen, if you're yeah. the owner of the thing, you can do whatever you want. But I appreciate him like showing up. Yeah, you don't have to be being there. there. But every time he's at work, you get the vibe that he's just He's got a little itch. He's like, I got to get to that football field. I know that there's stuff going on right now, and I got to find out what Eric's up to. I need to know what Eric is doing. I need to know what the Dillon Panthers are doing. I need to know everything that's going on over at the high school. I feel like there's a pep rally going on that no one told me about. Brad Leland did send us a text, Derek and I both, and he was like, okay, it's getting your, your buddy's getting a little bit better, but it's not quite there yet. He hates it. He hates well, well, my buddy. It's Gary. only with love. It is only out of love. It's all love. How much of your of buddy's day percentage wise do you think is filled up with thoughts of Panther football? <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, and we're talking the full day, not just days at work. We're mm-hmm. talking special moments with him and his wife. Yeah, we're talking <laughs> dinner. Mm-hmm. sleep. Yeah, I'd say Watch, probably Watching the Sopranos. Is- Matt asking Buddy for a job. Like, let's give this this 16-year-old kid one more thing that he has to do in his life because he doesn't have enough on his plate. Now he's looking for a job for his dad, too. My God. And I love the last line in this scene where Brad Leland, he goes, do you hunt? And you know that that's an improv. It's got to be. because it's just Brad There were so many times on Friday Night Lights where you're just trying to find a button for a scene and a button is just kind of like a a way for them to transition to the next moment. And 90% of, of the actor buttons that were thrown out on this show are completely and totally gone. You know oh, what they, I mean? All on the cutting room floor. Yeah, you 90% and I, of them. You and I have a great one that we did, but when we get to that episode, we'll talk about it. Ooh. This scene with Coach and Mr. Street, Mark Nutter, just, Mark Nutter played Mitch, Mitch Mitchell Street. This, yeah. my God, the weight and the heaviness of this scene. And just, I would like to say as counsel for either parties, this is that terrible idea that they are talking to each other. Yeah, yeah, it is. My dad's a lawyer and I'm sure my dad was sitting here going, oh, oh, what are you doing? It's beautifully acted though. One of the things I wanted to talk about in this, Stacey can can vouch for me. So there's a thing that we use as actors called given circumstances. What are your given circumstances in a scene? And one of the things that I love, and it's not really talked about, these guys play it like they've known each other forever. That coach, and so we do have a little bit of that backstory that's been told that coach has been around the street since he was in junior high, but he knows this guy. They know each other. They're friends. They're family. That's what hurts so much more. And knowing the given circumstances of what these characters have in the past, and it's not really elaborated on, but it's something that Kyle Chandler always brings to a scene. Anytime you have a scene with Kyle Chandler, he goes, hey man, so what do you, what do you think our relationship is? What do you, you think Billy and, and coach know each other? And I know that before this scene happened, they were probably having this conversation. And it makes the scene that much better. One of the beautiful things Mark Nutter does in this scene, in my opinion, I think a lot of actors would go for the jugular 
but he makes it more of an apology. It's an apology among friends. And as it gets more and more heated, that obviously, you know, that, that anger comes out, but it's an apology and he can't look coach in the eyes. And I love that when they shot this scene, they decided that they're, they're going to do it in the pharmacy that he works in. And they're going to have people in the background. So the two of them are having to whisper and not make it mm. be heard. All those little mm. elements come together and it gives this scene just real weight. So much weight. And then at the end, Mitch says, since I'm already dead, it doesn't matter. Like, I don't think I've heard heavier words in this. Like that guy is defeated to a point that I don't know that you come back from. Our writers do such a good job of presenting these situations, whereas an audience, you can go both sides. This isn't a black and white thing. Sure, you could argue that what the streets are doing is, is morally wrong, but what alternative do they have? It's one of the things that Friday Night Lights does so well is present an issue and you sit there evenly in the middle. It's not black and white. There's, there's gray. There's just gray. Living in gray. It's just a tough scene to watch, but it's... You're sitting there going, I understand where the streets are coming from, but I also understand where Coach is coming from. So it makes you that much more invested in the scene. And a lot of that is obviously from the writers, but then a lot of it is also just by these two really, really good actors you know, playing this scene together. We move on to Smash and Waverly. God, this, this kid with the confidence telling Waverly that there are rules. He's not that smooth at the start of this episode. I'm not going to lie. But I am liking this relationship with these two. It's opposites attract, you know? Yeah, I like seeing Smash genuinely not know his footing either. Like this girl keeps him on his toes in a way that he's like, I am very uncomfortable with this. He doesn't understand it. Yeah, Yeah. leads to some good stuff coming up in the episode. And Ash is great. Yeah, well, they both are. Ash and Gaius both are great in this this scene. So, Bob, as you refer to him, Bob, in my house. I haven't seen this episode before, but I do remember Annie showing me specifically the scenes between my mom and her, just so I would have a little bit of the backstory. So I I had a recollection of this, but I had completely erased it from my memory because it is like triggering. That guy smacks the heck out of her. Then Tyra wastes absolutely no time. Poker from the fireplace. And this scene is Intense. Yeah, it goes from zero to 60 in like 2.5 seconds. And I love that moment in the end where Adrian Palicki gets up in Bob's face and she goes, do it, mm-hmm. do it. And there's an intensity in her eyes. And it's like, oh, that's why Annie's gone on to be in John Wick. And Annie's gone on to be, you know, Joe. play these badass characters yeah. in G.I. Joe. And it's just, it's there. It's there immediately. But it's also why she got tired. And man, she's, she's great in this scene. So good. There, yeah, there was a snarl in her face to Bob. And I was like, oh, you're, you're a scrappy little devil. She says, do it. Yeah, with a snarl. And then she just kind of mouths it. And it's like, mm, it's tough. I don't, I'd have run away too if I was Bob. Ugh, I hate Bob. I hate Bob. The actor Bob. is lovely, but I, yeah, I can't stand Bob. I, I, I didn't get a chance to talk about it earlier because you jumped on to the next thing so quickly. Mm-hmm. But I, I didn't get a chance to talk about how much I love Dana Wheeler Nicholson, who on and off set is literally one of my favorite people on Friday Night Lights. She's I heaven. love this woman so much. I hope that all of you get a chance at some point in time to come into contact with her. She is just a beacon of positivity and so friggin' cool, who has the most amazing stories. We're going to have her on the show. The best stories. <laughs> She's lived that life. Yeah, she has. I mean, like met. Fidel Castro, Mm -hmm. Andy Warhol, Alec Baldwin, like back in the day. And yeah, I remember being a a little bit starstruck when I when I found out that she was going to play my mom because Tombstone is one of my all time favorite movies. And she's so good in it. And then my dad also, because of Fletch, was a big, a big, big fan. Dana's had a career, man. I mean, as audience, you guys got to remember, like, as Stacey and I have said, like, we hadn't done a lot of stuff up until this point. So to be working with a person like Dana, who has this resume, that's just ridiculous and was like a superstar in the 80s and and 90s. It was really cool for us. She had all these stories about all these people that we'd idolized growing up. Sorry to jump in there and have that little Dana Wheeler moment, but I love Dana Wheeler Nicholson. Uh, You're right. She is one of those people that when you're around, you just feel, I don't want this to sound kooky because I really mean it. Uh, There's like a handful of people in my life that when I'm around them, they have a healing property and I feel better after being in their presence. They're just a That 100% presence. sounds kooky because I don't buy into that kind of crap, but Stacy's right. It's true. Mm-hmm. 
Julie walks in because I she has seen again just the chaos that goes on at the Saracen house. She comes back home, yeah, and so sweetly tells her parents how much she loves them and they're the greatest parents in the world. And the complete and total opposite reactions of their parents is kind of exactly what I think would happen because the mom is always going to be like, mm, "That's not right. What happened?" I love that scene. That's a great scene. Kyle and Connie play it so well. <laughs> Kyle just takes it. He's so aloof. You know what I mean? She says, you guys are the greatest parents or whatever. And Kyle, like a little smile comes across his face, like knowingly, like, hey, we raised a good daughter. And he goes back to watching TV. And, and Connie immediately, Tammy turns around. And she's like, oh, no. Right. Something awful must have happened or whatever she says. And it's just the tale of two cities. They, these two just do not. Kyle is in his own world watching TV. He has no clue. And again, so well played. Tammy is right. Back to the... Colette House, Tyra, my sister, says to my mother, you're not alone. You've got me. And I just thought, um, hello. What about me? Yeah, exactly. What about you? You're off on a pole somewhere. Mindy's all about Mindy. You think Mindy cares what's going on? I'm kidding. But yes, that is a, a lovely little moment with the two of them. But I do feel, I do feel like, yeah, what, what about Mindy? I get it though. I don't think she, yeah. Mindy's not schmaltzy and she wouldn't be like, oh, I, I love you. You have me. I'd be like, get over it. Get out of bed and deal with your stuff. Mindy's probably already dealing with her own bad relationship. She can't. You're just making money. <laughs> of course, <laughs> Buddy Garrity opens up his office drawer and has a flag lapel pen. I bet there's yes. probably just like, he like Amazon bulk ordered probably 50 and just has him there waiting. Gives it to Matt's dad, Henry Saracen, and tells him to use his time in the service as a car salesman, which like, listen, as a business owner, not a bad idea, but um, I'm a Marine brat and it yes. like, it, it, well, that hit my gut a little bit. It's a little yucky. Uh, use what you got, right? I mean, that's the Buddy Garrity way, but I, I love this line that he has at the end of the scene. Because Henry's been talking to this couple, trying to sell them a car, and they obviously walk off the lot. And Buddy Garrity comes over and he goes, what happened? And Henry says, it was a bad time, mm -hmm. you know. And he goes, hey, it's never a bad time with 5.9% finance. It just felt like an absolute commercial right <laughs> yes. there for his Ford dealership. <laughs> it's never a bad time with 5.9% financing. I'm going to use that everywhere. I would like to point out that I find that Julie and Matt have the most mature, sensible relationship in all of Dillon, Texas, like maybe second to coach and wife. But these adorable 15, 16 year old kids are so level headed and so supportive of each other. It makes my heart so happy. And Matt's talking about his dad. And he says, I want him to want to be here because it still feels like so like walking on so many eggshells in that house with Henry being home. Zach Guilford's doing that same sweet thing where his head is just buried in his sweatshirt and he's making himself really small, which is such a like Zach Guilford choice that I, I yeah. love. Zach's a pretty confident guy. Like Zach is not the stuttering, you know, quiet, shy guy that is Matt Saris. Okay, now we're moving on to the most important part of the episode, the moment everyone's been waiting for, mm -hmm. the AWBLRF and F, which is the, <laughs> what was it, Stacey? The annual women's... Annual Women's Boosters League something rodeo fundraiser and fair. Well, I can't believe I remember that. Uh, there we go. Yes, yes. I don't know how Kyle memorized that. But uh, this is another one of those moments that we were talking about very early on with David Boyd directing this episode. The beautiful shots of this fair and this Ferris wheel and the rodeo. Just the lights and, behind it. Yeah. Oh. It's so Texas. It's got such a small town Texas vibe and it's such a wonderful job of setting up this scene. You know what I mean? And then on top of it, just a big shout out to all the background actors on this show that were just there through the thick and thin. It, this is one of those nights you can tell with the breath coming out that it was cold. And they and were there for not hours and hours and hours. Hours and hours on end, probably freezing their butts off. Yeah. But it's just, I mean, big shout out to David Boyd and the rest of the camera crew on this. They just do such a wonderful job of setting the scene for what this rodeo is going to be, you know, in this, this fair. Just beautiful. And it just feels like Texas. You're just in Texas in this moment. This episode is specifically, like I kept finding moments where it was just specifically beautiful. Makes, yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. I'm thinking about it now that it was David Boyd. It's like specifically very course, beautiful. Yeah. So now that Matt is, has become this incredibly mature 
boyfriend in the in a committed, wonderful relationship, I am completely here for him giving relationship advice to Smash. A, because he's dead on right about it, but B, he's like, he's earned it. Here he is, this wise soothsayer, man beyond his years, Matt Saracen. Uh, this is another moment where I, it was just like a quiet, beautiful FNL thing. We just catch for a minute Tim Riggins at the rodeo, kind of just hanging out. We see for a quick, quick second, he catches Tyra, but that's all we get in this scene. And that's all we need. You see the be- the Ferris wheel in the background. It's just so a really cool pretty. shot. It's so yeah. pretty. I just like to say, my sister is such a badass in this episode. We're finally giving Tyra her like, her legs and her voice and seeing who she exactly really is. And she tells her mom, I say my mom, it's not really my mom, <laughs> her mom that she has to choose between her and Bob. If she chooses Bob, yeah. then she's going to leave the house. She's got a yeah. voice and she's using it. We discussed earlier when we had Palicki on the show, just that very early on, I don't think the writers really knew what to do with her. And it's like, now they're finding what to do with her. And it's just magic. Tim comes in and he is doing, I would say, the just the most with this apology. I found it very sincere. I fully believed mm-hmm. everything he was saying, but Tyra still, it's like, if, if I said yes to this, I'd be a hypocrite in everything that I just believed. So as much as I want yeah. to hear you say this, no. Yeah, Tim basically asked her if she wants to get back together with him. I think that this is probably the first time that a woman in the Colette family is like stood on her own two feet and said no. 100%. You know, the pattern of, of violence is going to end here. And so there's like this hope. We don't know where this is going to lead, but it's the first time I think we're seeing this with this character, this character that we really didn't know much about. We're starting to see her stand on her own two feet. Uh, and she's breaking that family cycle of, of violence and of letting men treat you like crap. And a little bit of her hope and aspiration to get outside of Dylan when she's asking her mom about, yeah. like, why are you still here? I remember she asked her mom, and her mom says that she lived in Dallas for a little bit. This scene that I'm about to talk about might be... I think the sh- uh, maybe second only to you to to the grilled cheese scene between you and Tim, but a scene with no words and a bajillion words are spoken in it without being said, and it's just yeah. the look between Coach and Street at the fair. So much weight. Kyle Chandler used to always not even joke. I mean, it's the reality. They'd have whole monologues, and he'd look at it and be like, "I can do that with a look." And guess what? He did. Against all odds, Buckley winds up pulling off the upset against Arnett Mead, which means the Panthers are still alive and the Panthers are going to the playoffs now. So that's a huge thing. Of course, Buddy is going crazy. Everybody in Dylan is going crazy. They put the game on the, the microphone throughout the fair. So everyone in town is like celebrating because their hopes and dreams are still alive. The Dylan Panthers are making the playoffs and the Dylan Panthers are still hopefully on the road to state. Buddy Garrity, alone in church, singing a song And of course, he just assumes that God is a Panther fan. Of course. Why wouldn't he be? His worldview is just so insular to his own thoughts. And I I kind of appreciate that. Seems very simple. There's this scene between Coach and Street. I'm going to tell you selfishly, I was so, so happy with the scene that we had at the fair where they just saw each other and didn't talk. I almost didn't want this scene to happen. But what Street says is very sweet. And it's a lovely moment between the two of them. But I'm still torn about what I wish would have would have come up story-wise. But this is a beautiful scene, well acted between these two guys and well-written, of course. Yeah, you know, very sweet. It's always well-written. A little fist bump. Yeah. I would like yeah. to say that I find Matt Saracen to be the most mature 16-year-old that ever lived. All he's wanted is his dad back. He realizes his dad is terribly unhappy here and he's much better fit to be a soldier than an at-home dad. And he tells his dad to go back. We get a little bit of a break here because Tyra's packing up to leave home, assuming her mother's going to do everything she's always done. And Angela's like, you really thought that I would choose a man over my daughter? And my cold, tiny heart melted a little bit. Yeah, it's a beautiful scene. And just, I mean, going back to my love for Dana Wheeler Nicholson, she plays the scenes just so simple. So simple. When I was talking before about, like we answered some question about what the show was or or what it did for us. And I said that it completely changed my style of acting. The number one person who helped me realize how to act in front of a camera was Dana Wheeler Nicholson. And it wasn't because she told me anything. It was watching her. It was watching her in action and how simple and small it can be that portrays the most. Yeah, there's no ego involved. To end this, Smash just in the past couple episodes has been getting himself in trouble. That boy loves a foot in his mouth. 
but I find it humbling and sweet that he actually does have this genuine crush doesn't seem like enough, like genuine feelings for Waverly. I am wondering, side note, what's up with the steroids? I'm, I'm guessing they come back later. I hope that doesn't just go oh, away. They come back. Okay, good. Good, good, good. That makes me yeah. happy. Spoiler alert. Yeah, they come back in a big way. Uh oh. So here's, I love this scene with Gaius and Asha too, because I mean, it's the first time I think we've seen Smash humbled. It's the first time Smash has put his ego aside and we're actually getting to see him have a conversation with somebody that's not all ego. It's not all bravado. And he's just playing honest with her, that he likes her, that look, this is who he is and you're just going to have to get used to it. But he likes this girl. And that in and of itself makes it uh, just a really beautiful scene to watch. All that bravado being put aside, all that ego being kind of swept under a rug for a little bit, just so we can actually see who the real smash is. And even at the end, I'm not even so sure Waverly's buying it as a sense of like, I want to date you. She's like, okay, see you around. But there's a tiny little smirk at the end that gives me a little bit of hope, but she's not like fully fallen for this act yet. Listen, thoroughly enjoyed this episode. Yeah, it's a great episode. So beautiful to watch, but oh, so many heavy moments. And another thing real quick, if you remember correctly, we started this episode by talking about Slam and Sammy Mead kind of introducing the episode. And we transition out of this episode with Slam and Sammy Mead saying, stick around because there's going to be a lot of, that's kind of a, a, a wink and a nod to the audience that there's going to be a lot of crazy stuff coming forward. The games ahead are going to be, are going to be a struggle, which is, you know. I like, I like that. We had a little voiceover at the end of the show. Yeah, a little parallel to what's actually happening with our uh, characters in the show. So it's not just about football, Mm -hmm. once again. Well, I think that is it for our show. That's it for episode 12. But please join us next time for our special bonus episode where we answer your juiciest FNL questions. And hey, guys, be sure to check out Hello from the Magic Tavern, an improvised comedy podcast set in a fantasy world where everything said becomes canon. We recently had an opportunity to record an ad for them, and you can check that out on the December 6th episode. It was especially fun for me as I am a gigantic fan of Hello from the Magic Tavern. If you guys ever want to break up your rewatch podcast listening with some silly magical nonsense, I highly suggest it. And if you have the means, please, please, please support their new Patreon by going to patreon.com slash magic tavern. But until then, clear eyes, full hearts, can't can't lose. lose. Clear Eyes, Full Hearts is a podcast presentation of Cadence 13 in association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. Executive producers are Stacey Oristano and Derek Phillips, Chris and Mandy Wimmer for Black Barrel Media, and Steve Walters for Ritual Productions. Our producer is Miranda Parham. Send your questions to clearEyesFullHeartsPod at gmail.com. Find us on social media. I'm Stacey Oristano on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Derek Phillips on Twitter and underscore Derek Phillips on Instagram. And check out our websites, clearEyesFullHeartsPod.com, Cadence13.com, and BlackBarrelMedia.com. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next week.